Last week we began a series on forgiveness and we spent a good amount of time emphasizing the need for every single individual on the face of this earth to see his or her sin and his or her need to have forgiveness of that sin. We looked at three of the most difficult words in the English language to put together. I was wrong, followed by three more difficult words. I am sorry. We examined the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. That young man's life bottomed out. And it was only after he acknowledged his responsibility for his sin, and the sin was this. He left his father, took his share of the inheritance, and partied hard only after he acknowledged that, and only after he admitted that he was sick and tired of the mess that his life had become. It was only then that he was able to be helped. In that dirty, stinking pig pen, that young man took inventory of his life. What's my life all about? He assessed that. Some of us do well to stop and go, where's my life headed? Where am I at now? What needs to change? Am I satisfied? Do I have peace, contentment? The man confessed that he had messed up royally, the prodigal son, and he made a choice to return home where he would seek his father's forgiveness. He headed back home a truly broken man. And we learned that the father was longing for that son to return. And when he saw his son, saw him in the distance, the father immediately ran out to him and embraced him. That father was all about grace and mercy. And that, we said, was a picture of a loving and gracious, merciful Heavenly Father. Know this. God is pursuing you. C.S. Lewis calls God the relentless hound of heaven. He wants a relationship with us. He is waiting for us as individuals to respond to His pursuit. If we will humble ourselves and seek God's forgiveness, God will indeed grant that forgiveness. Those who uh, us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, sometimes we seem to be still struggling with the notion that our sins have been completely washed away. We seem rather skilled at replaying our sins in our minds, and many who name Jesus Christ get hung up on past sin. And it has a devastating, a crippling effect on our walk with the Lord. Even though God has forgiven us, the reality is, because I've talked to people week after week, some have a hard time, a difficult time accepting that forgiveness. And they have a hard time forgiving themselves. And they keep replaying over in their minds. They're fully cognizant, aware of what they've done. And they're stuck on that. They're prisoners of their past, even though they prayed and asked Jesus to forgive them. And that's what I want to speak to today. In order to forgive others and be set free from bitterness and resentment, we must first know the joy, the peace that our own sins are forgiven. We need, some of us, to be set free once and for all from our own sin. And it's hard for some people to accept the clear biblical teaching that when they come to Christ for salvation, their sin in its entirety is wiped away. And as always, we need to keep in mind that it's not how we feel or what we think that is the final say. Because I hear people, well, I feel this way. I don't feel like my sins are forgiven. I don't feel that way. Or I think this. What really matters is what does the Word of God say? What does God say in His Word? What does He teach us? Paul's words to the believers in the town of the city of Rome come to play at this point. People may know this verse because they've heard it so many times in church. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, is the best imaginable, the best possible news. The problem is this. It's not always easy to believe it. I'm firmly convinced that we who name the name of Jesus Christ, who profess Christ as Savior, we should proclaim the gospel to ourselves, get this, on a daily basis. 
It seems like many of us who claim to be believers, we pray to give our lives to Christ for salvation, but then we act as though the gospel has no relevance to our everyday life. We think that it gets us in the door, to, so to speak, but it's not part of our everyday life. In his lectures on the book of Romans, the Reformation leader Martin Luther declared, to progress is always to begin again. Real spiritual progress requires a daily going backwards. Our testimony as Christians is this. We are continually tested. And so we wonder to ourselves, sometimes we wonder out loud, how can there be no condemnation when, quite frankly, we all too often are failing our tests? Many of us have convinced ourselves that we are a major disappointment to the Lord. And I want to con comment on that sentiment, that we are constantly tested, that we fail all too often, and that God is disappointed in us. First of all, it is true that we are continually tested. I'm not going to stand up here and try to sell you a bill of goods. We are continually tested. There's no denying that reality. Second, while we sometimes fail miserably, that's certainly not always the case. With the Lord's enablement, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we successfully pass many of those tests. Perhaps we pass even the vast majority of those tests. But it's natural to think that we're colossal failures. It's innate, it's ingrained, it's inborn in us to focus on our failures more than our successes. Isn't that what we do when we get our report cards? We can get A's and B's, but if we get a D or an F, what happens? We obsess over that one less than satisfactory grade. We do the same thing when somebody critiques us. They call us in and they evaluate us, and they can say, all kinds of nice things about us. They can have all these wonderful words and these, all these accolades and praises of us. But if we hear one negative comment, we walk away and we obsess over that. They think I'm doing a lousy job. They think I'm a failure. They don't appreciate me. They said all those nice things and we forget those. Third, you are not a constant disappointment to God. That can't possibly be true if Romans 8, 1 is true. What you probably mean is this. You are disappointed in yourself because you haven't lived up to your own high standards, your own expectations, and your life currently isn't what you thought it could and should be at this point in time. So the question is, how do we fit all this together? How do we put all this together? First of all, we must accept what God says about us as true. God is writing to Christians. And if he says, not condemned, which Vince read for us, then we truly are not condemned. That means, as we read later in Romans chapter 8, that there is absolutely nothing that could ever serve to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's not my thinking. That's what Paul said writing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You can read it later, verses 31 to 39 of the same chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Second, God's tests are certainly not intended to destroy us but to reveal our weaknesses so that we will learn and commit to trusting Him and more. In God's economy, failure is often the back door to success. Third, you and I definitely are not the best judges of where we stand spiritually. Listen, on our best days... On our good days, we're not nearly as impressive as we think we are. God's not watching us going, wow, you really dazzle me with your spirituality. You are amazing. 
Thank you, God. I thought so, too. No, we're not nearly as good as we think we are, but know this. On our bad days, we're not nearly as miserable a failure as we sometimes deem ourselves to be. We do well to stop attempting to rate ourselves and make an effort instead to live a life of faith each and every day. Fourth, life is always a mixture of success and failure. We attain a little success to offer us much needed hope and a little and sometimes a lot of failure to teach us to remain humble and to continually trust in the Lord. Now, it might be advantageous for you to write out Romans 8.1 on a card and place it where you can readily see it and you can repeat it daily. Because I've talked to people who go, I'm still stuck on that, what I did in the past. I'm still stuck on it. And here's the problem for some of us. We want victory in our Christian lives, but we sit there and we go, are you kidding me? You think I need to write that? That's too much of an effort to write out those 10, 12 words or whatever. Listen, I didn't count the words, so don't go, let me see, one, two, three, four, and then send me a text this afternoon. Pastor Dave, you know there are more words in that verse than you said there were. That's not my point. My point is sometimes we want victory. If you're struggling with, am I completely forgiven, then write down Romans 8.1. Because I've, said, I've talked to people, and they're like, I'm not sure. I prayed, but I'm still struggling with whether I'm forgiven or not. This verse is the foundation of all spiritual progress. The fact is it's easier to believe it. Oh, they're not condemned anymore. We can believe that about somebody else, but it's harder to believe and accept for ourselves. So we need the constant reminder that in Christ we are eternally and always not condemned by God. Having said that, let's move on to examine what this verse really means. What do we discover when we move from the last section of Romans 7 to the first verse in Romans 8? We see two tremendous truths concerning our Christian experience. First of all, there is a struggle, an ongoing struggle in the Christian life. Romans 7, 14 to 25, and I'll just paraphrase it for you. I'll put it into 21st century living. In my mind, as a Christian, one who's put my faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, I sincerely desire, I long to please God. But there is something in me that seems to make me want to do the opposite. Over and over, Paul says, that which I would do, quite simply, I find myself not doing. And conversely, Paul says, that which I hate, I don't want to do, that's the very thing I find myself doing. So let's be honest, we can all identify with Paul's assessment there. We start our day praying. It goes something like this, Lord, good morning, I'm going to give today to you. I want today to be all about you. I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to follow your will for my life today. So we set out, we make a list, at least a mental list, of a number of things that we want to do that we know will be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And as the day unfolds, we find ourselves, well, I didn't do the first item. Well, I halfway did, half-heartedly did number two. I just skipped number three. Well, I got most of number four done, and, well, I'm not even going to try number five now. And then we make the commitment, okay, Lord, I know I got a problem, but I'm not going to lose my temper today. But by 10 a.m., we've done just that. We uh, failed miserably by blowing up. And then we say, you know, there's a lot of gossip going on where I work. There's a lot of gossip among the students. And I'm not going to be part of that today. But by lunchtime, we felt that as well. The very things we said we're going to do, we don't do. And the things we pledged, committed to not do, that's what we're doing. Some of us have lived that very reality this week. And if you're going, hi, not me. Let's see, someone in here did. Was it that guy over there? Is that that lady over there? Did did they messed up this week? Believe me, most of us have been there. Allow me to make a couple points. First Romans 7 is Paul's autobiography of his experience as a believer in Christ. Now, 
I don't agree whatsoever with those who see Romans 7 as either a defeated or a subnormal Christian or non-Christian experience or a person under conviction. I believe Romans 7 is one stage, one part of the normal Christian life. It's possible, in fact, likely that you can be growing and making strides in your Christian life and still struggle in being totally obedient to Christ. In Romans 7, Paul's being totally honest. He was communicating this. Even though I am an apostle, even though I go around planting churches, even though I've been commissioned directly by the Lord Jesus Christ, I still feel this struggle between my sincere desire to serve God wholeheartedly and my quest to gratify the flesh, the old nature, the natural man. Let's be honest today. Romans 7 describes a daily struggle that is very much a part of our endeavor to walk closely with the Lord. We should be able, if we're going to be honest, to identify with Paul's lament in verse 24 of Romans 7. What a wretched man I am. He's talking about every single one of us. We struggle in many different ways. We struggle between what we actually know and what we actually do. We struggle between our better desires and our lesser desires. We struggle between what we know God wants us to do and what we would prefer to do if God would just leave us alone. It's part of what it means to live in a sin-cursed world. And quite honestly, some people would prefer to go to church and not hear the truth. Paul said they want their ears tickled. They want to walk in and out and never be under conviction of the Holy Spirit. They, there are people that would like to ignore the reality of the ongoing battle between the old man and the new man. But that would not be consistent with the Word of God. Anyone who would ever attempt to give you the impression that a Christian will never struggle with this ongoing battle has a non-biblical view of what it really means to live the Christian life. If Paul is an apostle, and if Paul is a man called directly by Christ, and if Paul is a man who planted churches, and if Paul who wrote many of the passages of Scripture, if he struggled, we're also going to struggle. Quite often, people come to Christ for salvation, and shortly after, they get upset because things don't continue to go well. They find themselves having relational problems and financial problems and emotional struggles and marital issues and problems in other areas of their life. Soon that emotional exhilaration, that emotional high of knowing their sins are forgiven, they were saved, that dissipates and discouragement begins to set in and disillusionment takes root. And then people find themselves getting disgruntled with God and they're asking, what is going on? What exactly is wrong with me? Often the fact is there's nothing deeply wrong. It's simply the reality that you're experiencing a battle between your two natures as a believer. The old nature that seeks to gratify self and the new nature that wants to walk after God. And Paul wrote about that struggle in Galatians 5. He said, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh because they're at war against one another. Second, this struggle that we have, it's real, but as a believer, it is without condemnation. The rest of Romans 8 is a re-emphasis of cha uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Now, in the original Greek language, the first word in verse 1 is not therefore, nor is it is, nor is it now. The first word in the Greek in verse 1 is no. Paul was attempting for his readers to understand in the strongest possible way, that there is no condemnation. That's why he put the word no at the beginning of that verse. We could translate it this way. There's no condemnation, none whatsoever, for the believer in Christ Jesus. Let me further explain. It doesn't mean that there's no cause for condemnation. That wouldn't be accurate because the reality is you and I do fail. We all stumble, we fall, we get off the path, and you say, not me, Pastor. 1 John 1, 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. James 3.2 says we all stumble in many ways. 
Paul is not saying that there's no cause for condemnation because if God were looking at us and judging us moment by moment, God would surely find plenty of cause to condemn us. That's not what Paul's saying. Is Paul saying there's no, now no failure for those in Christ Jesus? No, we know we fail. There's therefore now no struggle? No, we know we struggle. There's therefore now no stumbling? No, we know we stumble. What then is Paul saying in verse 1? There's no condemnation, no punishment, no coming into judgment, no penal servitude for the follower of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what that means? We may stumble. We may fall. We may make a thousand mistakes. We may and we do sin. We may get off the path. We may go astray. We may veer. But for the true believer in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation because God said there is none. You can and you will struggle, but you will not be condemned. You can fall, get off the path, but you aren't condemned because God has declared that he will no longer condemn those that are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus saved you, he didn't promise you that he would immediately then and forever take away all your problems. He did say this, in your problems, there's no condemnation. In your failure, in your going astray, if you are a child of God, there is no condemnation. What's that mean? It means this. There is good news for prodigal sons. One, there is no rejection for the child of God. God's not going to cast you away. He's not going to reject you because you struggle. Let's just return for a moment to the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. That young man went to his father requesting his share of the inheritance. He said, I don't want to wait till you die. I want to enjoy it now. I want to go, like many young people, I want to go out and sow my wild oats while I have my health and while I'm young. And when he got the money from his dad, that guy went out and he partied it hard until his money disappeared. And when his money disappeared, so did his so-called friends. He finds himself at rock bottom feeding pigs, the most despicable job for a Jewish young man. Quickly, this guy goes from being top dog to being the lowest man on the totem pole. He decides there in that pig pen that the best course of action would be for him to humble himself and return home, throwing himself at the mercy and grace of his father. And he said, in that pig pen, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to my father. And where was the father when his son was approaching home? Dad wasn't sitting in the house. Dad was out on the road, and when he saw his wayward son, he took off and ran to him. Now, in that culture, older men didn't just take off and run. That wasn't very dignified. But he didn't care to Dad what others thought. He went in full pursuit. And that is a picture of our experience as believers. There is no rejection for those that are in Christ Jesus. Even those who wonder, even those who stray, even those who've been living a long time in a far country, and quite frankly, they are today embarrassed because they have squandered the spiritual benefits of the kingdom. There's no condemnation. That may be where some of you are. You were saved a while back. But you know in your heart of hearts, you've wandered off, and you're not walking with God. Nobody else knows that. You have other people full. They have no idea because they don't know you outside of Sunday morning. But you know it, and if you're going to be honest, you're saying, I'm embarrassed before the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you're scared to turn back because you think, God, you've finished with me. You're going to condemn me. You're going to reject me. Keep this in mind. God knows everything that you've done. He already knows it. He knows not only that, everything you've dreamed of doing. And guess what? He loves you anyway. The old children's song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. I was in a craft shop. And listen, guys, if you go, I ain't going in a craft shop. Happy wife, happy life. I love my wife. I have no problem going in a craft shop. I consider myself a man's man. But I was in a craft shop, and I saw this sign, and it said, Jesus knows me, this I love. Think about that. He knows you. You don't have to hide from him. And he loves you. 
If you put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, you are part of his family. You are still his child. The moment you say, if you're not where you want to be, I will arise and I will go to my father confessing what I've done and I'll seek his forgiveness and mercy. In that very moment, God will say to you, welcome home. Welcome back into a relation, uh, fellowship with him. Not a relation, but fellowship. The relationship is never severed. Kill the fatted calf. Let's have a party. This child who went astray is now back home. So what do we do when we fail? The reality is sometimes we make the same dumb mistake over and over. What then? We repent. By God's grace, our eyes have been opened to recognize what we've done. We change our mind. We stop making excuses. We stop trivializing it. We confess to God and to others as it's appropriate. And we seek God's help. We enlist the help of others. And we ask God, God, forgive me and strengthen me as I move forward. So often the Christian is thinking, I've messed up. I am a failure. Surely God must hate me after what I've done. Let me tell you that that is a lie from the pit of hell. Satan is the father of all lies. Our sins, yes, they hinder us from the ability to have a close walk with God, but it can never reverse the divine proclamation of there's no condemnation. For many of us, depending how we grew up and how we were taught about God, it's extremely difficult to believe that God loves us, especially when we're honest and take a good, long look in the mirror. Most of us, when we look at the mirror and examine ourselves, we're, we're going to say, listen, pal, there's plenty of room for condemnation. Trust me, according to the Scriptures, that's not God's heart. God says there's no condemnation. Look at verse 1. There's no condemnation for who? Those that are in Christ Jesus. The question is, are we truly willing to believe what God says? We sang the old hymn of invitation, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Those words sound familiar to you? We sang them this morning, if you're looking like a... Somewhere along the line I heard his words. We sang them this morning. They should sound familiar to you. Do you believe those words? Do you honestly believe that Jesus paid it all? If so, there can be no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you, is Jesus enough for you? Second, there's no punishment. There's discipline. And there's correction because the Lord loves us. Time doesn't permit, but Hebrews 12, 4 to 11 says, Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he disciplines. Listen, if you are a good parent, you are going to discipline your children when they do wrong because it's to their benefit. You just don't let them run loose and disobey you and break all your rules you discipline them because you love them, because you want them to grow up. Now, that discipline may, may be painful, but it's necessary and it's not abusive. Um, it, it amazed me because I think, well, some people probably dozed off at the 815. How many of you have ever watched a Little League baseball game? Some people didn't raise their hand. I think they, if the person beside you didn't raise your hand, nudge them because they're probably sleeping. Don't put their hand up. They'll look around and go, oh. What do, we, what do I raise my hand for? What do I vote for? It is amazing to watch little tykes learning how to play ball. Some of them swing at pitches several feet over their head. And I've watched good coaches encourage the fielders, move up in the outfield. I've watched them say, stay down on that ground ball. Some kids... One guy come up after. Some kids are terrified to go near the ball. They think it's a grenade and it's going to blow up. They may saw somebody else get hit and they go, like, I ain't doing that. They make a glaring error, these young children, and they begin to tear up. But the good coach of such impressionable children will encourage them, even if they've messed up royally. If they swung at a bad pitch, the coach will yell, That's a good cut, nice swing good try. If they made a bad throw or missed a catch, the coach will say, nice try, good effort, you'll get it next time. What a difference the words of affirmation and encouragement can make. That is what God does when we mess up 
and we seek his forgiveness. God is there waiting patiently to pick us up, tell us where we went wrong, and get us back in the game. That's what Paul means when he writes, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Tragically, too many Christians go through life carrying a heavy load of guilt, not just because they struggle, but because they feel in their heart condemned by God. They feel like God hates them, that God's disgusted with them, that God's given up on them. That is not the God of the Bible. God loves us with an everlasting and an unconditional love. Where do I get that? Jeremiah 31, 3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Romans 5, 8, God showed, He commended, He demonstrated His love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when He has to discipline us, He does it for our own good and for His glory. He is chastising us. It's for our benefit. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Why? Because our sins are gone. Why? Because Jesus dealt with sin by a sacrificial death on the cross. Satan condemns us day and night. He wants to whisper in our ears, condemned, condemned. God boldly declares no condemnation. It all boils down to this. Who are you going to believe? Satan, the father of all lies, or God who cannot lie? Three things remain true in the midst of your struggle. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are eternally secure. John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No man can pluck them out of my hand and my Father is greater than me. No man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. 1 John 5, 12, he that has the Son, that's Jesus, has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. The very next verse, John said, I've write, written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. When Jesus saves you, he keeps you saved. You can never lose your salvation. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? You must be born again. Now, I have people going, I want to get born again, again. I, I need to be saved again. Listen, he didn't say, Jesus didn't say, you must be born again and again and again and again. He saves you. He gives you eternal life. This isn't a trick question, so you shouldn't have to think too long. How long is eternal life? forever. You say, well, I was saved and then I got straight off and now I'm not saved anymore. Well, how long were you saved? Well, those 10 years. Now, I, that's 10-year life. No. He gave you eternal life. He saved you. He keeps you saved. Second, you are internally free. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot lose your salvation. You are no longer bound. God doesn't have you on some performance standard in order for you to have to attempt to earn His grace. Grace is a free gift. No longer should you sense a need to go out and try to gain God's approval based on your own efforts. No, because you have been accepted by God because of His Son's shed blood. You should be now motivated to serve Him out of love, not obligation. You're not trying to please God, gain His love of you by what you do. You understand that He has simply chosen in His sovereignty to love you. He demonstrated that love for you on the cross, and you say, I can't believe it, but it's true. He loves me. He loves a wretch like me, and you know what? I owe Him my life, and I want to go out, and I willingly want to serve Him. Third, you're positionally perfect. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ and he credits you with all that's said about his son Jesus. Let me ask you, who is it in verse 1 that is not condemned? Look at the verse. Those who are in Christ Jesus. So as we close, I want you to understand this. There are only two choices when it comes, only two places you can be when it comes to God. You are either outside of Christ and you are lost or you are in Christ. Jesus made that clear in John 3, 18. He that believes in me is not condemned. But 
He who has yet to believe in me, to trust in me, is condemned already this very moment. Look, we could start here in the front and go all the way to the back, come to the back, start to the front. Every single one of us is either condemned or not condemned. And it's based solely on what you've done with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you are against me. If you are without Christ, you're one breath, a heartbeat, one breath away from eternity. And if you're without Christ, you stand condemned this very moment. If you're without Christ, God's wrath towards sin awaits you. If, however, you are in Christ, you put your faith in Him, your judgment is behind you. It's in the past. Jesus took the punishment for your sins on the cross. So where do you stand? If you're outside of Christ, you don't know where you stand, I urge you this morning to run to the cross, to run to Jesus. And when you come to Jesus for salvation, you will discover the most liberating truth in the world. That in Christ, there's no condemnation. He has removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. Psalm 103, 12. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We sang that, whiter than snow. You washed me whiter than snow. Can you say that the blood of Jesus has washed you whiter than snow? And I'll close with this verse. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You say, well, what's the truth? Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. You know Jesus as your Savior. You are free. Free to serve Him. Let us pray. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. You may be here and you're honest enough to say, Pastor, as I hear it, I'm not sure that my sins are forgiven. I've never trusted in Jesus personally for my salvation. I know about Jesus. I know what he did on the cross, but I've never applied that to my own life. I understand that I need a relationship with Jesus. That's what I want. You can have that by praying a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit I readily owe up to the fact I'm a sinner. And I understand it makes me spiritually dead. But Jesus, I'm also aware that you went to the cross of Calvary, and on that cross, you shed your blood and you gave your life to pay for my sin. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me, to cleanse me. Jesus, I'm opening my life and I'm inviting you in to be my Savior. And I want to follow you from this moment on as the ruler of my life. Thank you for saving me today. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer, just ask you to slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out in any fashion whatsoever. But you, yes, are there any others? Say, I pray today. Yes. Are there any others? Yes. Perhaps you're here and you say, I prayed and I believe Jesus saved me, but Pastor, I'm still having trouble believing, forgiving myself. And I need to make that a matter of prayer, to learn that verse. I'm not condemned anymore. I see it in the Scriptures. And I need to walk by faith, and I need to believe that verse. Pray for me, Pastor, that I might have complete peace, that my sins are forgiven. Yes, are there any others that say I need to? Father, I thank you for speaking to hearts as only you can through your Word and through your Spirit. I thank you today, Lord, for those that give their lives to Jesus Christ for salvation. Today is the start of their spiritual journey. I pray that they look back and go, October 15th of 2017, I became a member of God's family. I prayed. He forgave me. Jesus is my Savior. I pray that they have that assurance from this moment on. And for those, Lord, Satan keeps throwing back, what about this? What about that? I pray that they go, no, nope, I'm not going to win anymore. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Jesus. I'm no longer condemned. I am free, free to serve Jesus. I'm whiter than snow because Jesus washed me. Lord, I pray that you continue the work you've begun in us, that you find us faithful. Give us a love for others, the love that you have for others. May our light shine before men this week. They might see our good works and glorify you, our Father in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.